Well, welcome again to worship. If you are new, I'm Pastor Josh, and we are grateful to continue to be looking through God's Word and the fruit of the Spirit. And so I want to uh, welcome those that are watching online from various places. I want to say hello specifically to the Rhinelander campus and uh, those of you that are gathering there with Justin Olson, Pastor Justin, and um, just grateful to God for you and what God is doing in that pocket of our community and this church. We are one church in two locations, and I'm just grateful to God for you. So uh, this is our sixth fruit that we are looking at in this series, the fruit of the Spirit. And uh, I believe it is the, the sixth week that Rhinelander has been meeting uh, since we launched publicly, so that's exciting. Uh, so at any rate, I'm grateful that we can be in God's Word together today. Let me kind of jump in. A couple summers ago, I had the privilege of speaking at a Fort Wilderness family camp for about a week. And over the week, it was my joy to just get to know people in that setting and I remember walking up to a circle of young adults who were standing near the beach of the, uh, the waterfront area at Fort, and they were kind of circled up a little bit, chatting with each other. I came up, and it turned out it was a group of summer staff, and the leader of that group turned to me and just said, uh, how you doing? And I said, I'm good. To which they all were like, whoa, no, not okay, man. We cannot just answer good, not in this group. Uh, we're all about sharing how we're doing. We really want to know. So, how are you? And <laughs> I remember kind of thinking to myself, well, you may want to know. I may not want to tell you. Uh, but I actually really appreciated their, their heart behind that. So I began to answer. And I remember finding it, first of all, a little bit challenging to be honest about my answer and maybe say, well, am I good or not right now? But I was good, and then I remember it being difficult defining what it meant for me at that point to be good. The fruit of the Spirit in focus this week is goodness. In many ways, maybe the easiest to understand broadly, but in other ways the hardest to define specifically. I think with all the other varieties of spiritual fruit, we can kind of instinctively define them and get pretty close. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Those are mostly decipherable. But in my preparation for the message this week, I found it a little bit challenging to define very specifically this fruit of goodness. I found just sitting down to think about goodness that it was hard to define in detail. I found myself asking questions like, what did the writer of this letter most likely mean when he said goodness? Uh, what would be the opposite of this fruit in this context? How is goodness different from some of the other similar fruit, like love and kindness? How is goodness uniquely different from them? And then what would it look like in our life if the fruit of goodness Goodness showed up in abundance. So it was a little bit challenging, and yet in the end, I think I have found the examination of this fruit and the consideration of it and what we're going to go through together right now to be encouraging to my heart, to be practical, and I'm excited to think with you about it. So here's, here's what I want to do with you today. I want to think with you about goodness, and I want to offer three ways to think about goodness, man-centered goodness, God-centered goodness, and the fruit of goodness. Man-centered goodness, kind of several, I want to think through with you several historic human definitions of what good is. Uh, God-centered goodness, I want to look at a number of scriptural definitions of what good is. And then the fruit of goodness, some possible life applications of what doing good could look like. That's where we're going. Would you bow your heads and pray with me one more time? Heavenly Father, thank you for your goodness and for the way we can trust you and your character and your presence right now. I pray that you would still our hearts and our minds 
that we would just trust you. That we would recognize if you are who you say you are, then right now as we look at your word, you're doing something here. You're doing something in our midst. You're doing something within each of us. May we be aware of that and respond. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let me set things up again by reading the text that has formed the basis of this series, Galatians 5, 22 to 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now again, our focus is the sixth fruit of the Spirit, which is goodness a God-centered goodness that comes exclusively from the work of the Spirit inside of Christ followers. But before we think about what that is, let's sort of think together about what it is not by looking at man-centered goodness. We all know in general what the opposite of good is. Just finish this sentence for me. Uh, I saw a movie the other day. I read a book the other day. And it was a classic story of good versus evil. We know that the opposite of good is evil. And there's pretty broad agreement globally, historically, among a bunch of different cultures, all different cultures, that good, not evil, is the path that we should all take. It's just that it's been hard for mankind to define with some unity what that good is. Uh, The ancient Greeks in particular held several schools of thought. One school of thought saw good as the pursuit of pleasure. Or in other words, the the eradication of pain. Uh, Obviously, this line of thinking is attractive in a lot of ways, uh, but it often leads to a lot of our modern woes. If my pleasure is the good, then anything that causes me displeasure is bad. Uh, So when tension grows in our relationships or in our workplaces, we quickly decide that we owe it to ourselves to get out. Or when we're doing something that's challenging and uncomfortable, we could tend to give up. When this is the definition of good, the pursuit of pleasure. Uh, This tack veers toward selfishness, laziness, a loss of self-respect, a lack of commitment and character. The pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain is a huge deal in our Western culture, especially these days, but it has arguably produced more misery misery than it has alleviated. Another school of thought when it comes to man-centered goodness saw good as acquiring knowledge. Uh, This means that the ultimate good is seeing ignorance as the enemy and education as the silver bullet. And like the pursuit of pleasure, this approach has some obvious merits. But it is dependent on the assumption that once people are taught what is good, they will sort of instinctively and spontaneously and joyously choose to do it. This leads to the concept of knowledge as savior and education as deliverer. Yet another man-centered approach simply defines good as the golden rule. Now, that definition uh, is biblical. Jesus talks about uh, doing to others as you would have them do to you, but it's not the only thing. So when the golden rule is the uh, definition of good exclusively, doing to others what you would have them do to you, uh, the challenge with this approach is that it's not supposed to be all there is. What we wish done to us is not always good, to everyone else. For example, a fable. Uh, There once lived a monkey and a fish. Uh, The monkey followed the golden rule, always trying to treat others as he wanted to be treated, but he sometimes applied the rule foolishly. 
One day a big flood came, and as the waters rose, the foolish monkey climbed a tree to safety. Then he looked down and saw a fish struggling in the water. He thought, I wanted to be lifted from the water. So he reached down and grabbed the fish from the water, lifting him to a higher branch where the fish died. The golden rule is helpful, but it's not all there is. When the golden rule is the limit of our focus, it becomes man-centered again. It's possible to make foolish decisions. That definition of good alone is flawed because we are flawed. Two more. Another ancient concept saw good as the greatest benefit to the greatest number. Uh, Pretty attractive in a democracy, which, by the way, no government ever is a pure democracy, 100%. The United States is actually a constitutional republic, precisely because when everything is put to a popular vote, the majority always rules, but the majority is not always right. What is good for the majority may be fine for them, but might be downright evil for the minority. And lastly, a last man-centered definition of goodness uh, that kind of comes from ancient times but is alive and well today. Um, In fact, I think most people in a way kind of unconsciously adopt this definition. It's defining good as gaining goods and goodies. Uh, But this always fails to satisfy. Uh, On our hunting trip last weekend, so we were gone, uh, I was gone last weekend and and, um, I was away Pheasant hunting South Dakota left, drove uh, 10 hours from here to where we were in South Dakota. And on the way, uh, I was, we had stopped at a gas station, I was standing in line. I saw posted on the walls of the gas station the odds of winning the lottery. Something like one in 40,000 people win the $100 prize. One in 40,000. So that would be like, If Lambeau Field was packed, two people in that stadium would uh, win the $100 prize. That's the odds of winning the $100 lottery ticket. Uh, How about the million-dollar lottery ticket? I'm not even talking about the Mega Millions uh, jackpot that is up to like $700 million right now. But uh, what about the $100 million lottery ticket? Uh, It was like one, a one in 10 million chance. That's like twice the population of Wisconsin in total. But it happens, somebody wins uh, eventually, and often uh, it ruins the person who wins. Studies have shown uh, that after winning the lottery, for most people that win, the rest of their lives become mundane. It obliterates their happiness. Gaining goods and goodies fails to satisfy our deepest needs and can become a curse and a monster. All of these man-centered ancient theories of good live on in one form or another today. The pursuit of pleasure, acquiring knowledge, the golden rule, the greatest benefit to the greatest number, gaining goods and goodies. And just to be real, there's a measure of There's a measure of goodness in all of these definitions of good. There's a measure of validity in all of them, but they all have the same fatal flaw. They are all man-centered. They're all limited or mistaken in one way or another. They all take man as the measure of all things, which is the fatal flaw of our time. But our heart in this church And in this gathering of people seeking to know God, uh, seeking to know what their next step of faith might look like, trusting that Jesus is alive, trusting in the historic uh, account, historical account of Christ and the Gospels, uh, our heart as we seek the Lord is to trust that God, not man, is the measure of all things, including goodness. So let's look together next at at God-centered goodness. What does does God have to say about goodness in the Bible? A lot. He talks 
a lot about goodness all over Scripture. In fact, I, I could spend the rest of our time just in this message and probably another three messages just simply reading word for word the Scriptures that reference good and God's goodness. Uh, in Genesis 1, it takes no more than, than four verses uh, right at the beginning of, uh, of the account of creation to reference uh, to reference good. Genesis 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good. And he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And you go through each of these days where God creates. And with just the, 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 the power of his voice, uh, he initiates. And the very last verse in Genesis 1 is Genesis 1.31. God saw that all he had, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. After God created everything, he said it was good. In 1 Chronicles 16.34, we are implored to give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Psalm 34.8 encourages us to taste and see that the Lord is good. In Ephesians 2.10, it is revealed that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good. In James 1.17, we find that every good and perfect gift is from, from above. And the 23rd Psalm concludes with the eternal affirmation, Surely, your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Your goodness. The pursuit, and, and listen to me, I really, truly believe this, the pursuit of God-centered goodness is what gives our life ultimate meaning and purpose. The pursuit of God-centered goodness is what gives our life direction and the different junction points and transitions and, and crises in our life. And that goodness is revealed to us in God's works, in his words, and in his will. In creation, in scripture, and in prayer. This is where I found uh, just a great degree of stability in my spirit in preparation uh, for our time together in this message. Listen, I'm on this journey with you as we seek to understand what the fruit of the Spirit is and as we seek to expand um, our holy imagination to want these fruit, uh, these varieties of, of spiritual fruit, to want them in abundance in our community and in our lives. And this stability came from anchoring my understanding of this fruit of goodness in what God says all over Scripture. Just looking up what goodness is according to God's Word. It was also helpful for me to see what the Apostle Paul said in the rest of Galatians 5. So earlier in this chapter, uh, Paul talked about the good race. In verse 7, when he was challenging the Galatian Christ followers who were becoming distracted and disobedient by explaining, you were running a good race, who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? So what I love about this exercise is actually asking ourselves, what is good? And then saying, okay, goodness is referenced here in the text. Is there any way we can get a sense of what that goodness is? by looking at the context of where this verse is. And we, again, we see in verse 7, Paul asking them, you were running a good race. So he defines what they were doing as, as good. Well, what is that? Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? So in this context, the good race means obeying the truth. And if we keep on going, in verse 13, we learn that the opposite 
of that, according to, again, verse 13, means indulging the flesh. So the good race is obeying the truth. The opposite of that is indulging the flesh. Going on to verse 17, it clarifies what that means. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. Goodness is a fruit of the Spirit. The flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. That's why immediately following the fruit of the Spirit, in verse 24, we learn that those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So I'm trying to just lead us through noticing in Galatians 5, how good is defined, what the opposite of good is. And what I see is that according to chapter 5 of Galatians, God-centered goodness is the opposite of our sinful nature, which in this context is referred to in kind of in a, in a shorthand way as the flesh. Not, not literally our flesh, but our sinful nature, our tendency to go against God, our, our built-in knack to want to push God away. which verses 19 to 21 define pretty clearly. They define this flesh pretty clearly. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Frankly, that's the best definition of the opposite of goodness that I can find. Which is helpful. It's helpful to know what the opposite of something is. Here's why. I I believe we are either pulled with passion or pushed with pain. Often in our lives, we're either drawn by something that is is our goal or we're pushed by something that is the opposite of our goal. And both are needed at times in our lives. Knowing what God's goodness is and knowing what it is not by reading this entire chapter is an example of being pushed with pain. Like, are, are any aspects of any of this in your life, in, in verses 19 to 21, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. So obviously, there's like some big ugliness in there, but there's a lot of like tendencies in us to move in these directions, frankly. So any any aspects of any of this in your life, then hear the call of God's goodness and stop doing that. Hear the call of God's goodness and feel the push of that pain and stop doing this. Uh, On our pheasant hunting trip recently, I'll tell you another story. Uh, One of my uncles brought two shotguns. Uh, One was a more current, like a more recently manufactured shotgun. It was an over-under, a 12-gauge it had uh, holes in the side of the, the barrels near the, near the muzzle, which are called ported. Uh, it, it was ported, so it kicks a little bit less, and uh, it's just a nicer uh, shotgun with a little bit more current kind of technology or whatever. He also brought an old side-by-side shotgun that he'd had for years, and this gun didn't fit him as well as the other one fit him. And he was shooting it one day, and he brought it up fairly quickly, and the stock didn't get all the way to his shoulder, and he pulled the trigger, and it fired, putting the repercussion of that, uh, of that gunfire back onto his uh, bicep, and it made this huge bruise on his bicep. And it, it got to be a joke, because he showed us the bruise like the next day, and it was massive, and it was dark purple, and it was really ugly. And people would walk by as he was lifting up his short sleeve shirt and say, oh, don't you know you have to, to mount that on your shoulder? And uh, his, his answer was, uh, uh, no kidding. <laughs> I, I figured that out. 
Um, I experience the pain of the opposite of doing what I ought to do. And so seeing the bruise was a helpful reminder for all of us of what not to do. It's helpful to know the opposite of a thing. The term flesh in Galatians 5 means our sinful nature. It's what life looks like when man is the measure of all things. Which again, I think is the fatal flaw of our time. Our heart is to trust that God, not man, is the measure of all things. That the pursuit of God-centered goodness is what gives our life ultimate meaning and direction. Which brings us to the third and final way to think about this, which is the fruit of goodness. Uh, Or in other words, I want to think with you about what some possible ways to live this out in our lives could be. What could it look like for the fruit of the Spirit, goodness, to be abundant in our lives? Uh, The root of the Greek word for good in Galatians 5.22 is uh, agathos. Uh, According to scholar and theologian F.F. Bruce, this may well mean primarily generosity. Uh, That's what Pastor David Jeremiah said as well. He said, The more I studied this word in the Bible, the more one central concept seemed to jump out. God's goodness conveys his generosity. His goodness means far more than his generosity, but it certainly includes his infinitely generous attitude toward us. By nature, he longs to bring joy and blessing to all his creatures. Now, if this is true, my call for us today is to just dream about this fruit of goodness in abundance among us. What what would it look like if our knee-jerk reaction were one of a generous spirit? What What would that look like among us as a community of faith here in the Northwoods, Wisconsin? What would it look like among us as people seeking after God and God's goodness, what would it look like among us? In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus called his followers to let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. What if our good deeds included a generous work ethic that caused all of us to stand out in the way we did our jobs. You know the landscape of, of job openings and the, our, our economy today. What if as followers of Christ we had a generous work ethic that we worked as for God and not for men, that we worked hard, that we showed up early and we stayed late and, and, and our sense of worth didn't come from our work. It's not our identity. We're not workaholics. But when we worked, we worked hard. What if our good deeds included a generous work ethic? Or how about living in our relationships, our our marriages, with generous amounts of grace and forgiveness? Sticking with them when we were disappointed. Staying committed. Generous amounts of grace and forgiveness abounding in our lives, the fruit of goodness. What about the way we we generously give of our time, our talent, and our treasure to the work of God? I'm so grateful. I, I need you to hear me on this. I'm so grateful for so many of you in our community of faith, in the way that you show your generosity in giving to this church and this this local community of faith. But it's just sort of something worth saying out loud that when we're faithful to the Lord to regularly tithe and give to his ministry and to his work in the local church, I believe, and and I've experienced myself, that there is a joy and a reassurance in our personal lives as a result of collaborating with the Lord in his good works. What would it look like if our lives were 
lived out in generosity in all kinds of ways. When we know God's good will to live a generous life in our relationships, in our work, in our giving, and we choose to do it, we live a deeply fulfilling life of faith that is a far cry from simply the pursuit of pleasure. I believe in Christ that that is the fruit of goodness. So which definition of goodness are we going to accept and live out? A man-centered goodness or a God-centered goodness? What aspirations will we cherish? What dreams will we have as followers of Christ, as a community of faith? The good life now or the well-done, good, and faithful servant later? The interesting thing about this pursuit is that the fruit is from God, period. It's just from God. But the decision is ours. We can choose to cultivate goodness or not. We can, we can dream about it and crave it and long for God's fruit to be abundant in our lives or not. And a life of this pursuit is a process. It's not an event. That's what... I'm all in on with you, is this, this way of walking through life, following Christ, seeking Him, and living together and doing that together, day in and day out, next step after next step, a life of walking in step with the Spirit, a life of learning what God's goodness is not and avoiding that, but more so learning what God's goodness is and craving that. Will you join me? Let's trust Christ together. Let's trust our Savior and live to know his goodness in our lives. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may we be a people defined by your kind of goodness. May we be a people defined by your kind of generosity in all areas of our lives. In the way that we treat those we are in close relationship with, in the way that we work, in the way that we give. Lord, may we be a, a generous people of faith. Thank you again for letting us just hone in and kind of drill down on each of these fruits of the Spirit. What a, what a joy it has been for us to, to think through this together. And so I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for this time that we've had. Please guide us and give us an opportunity this week, Lord, to see your goodness abound. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you this week.